Okay, so today we're going to start a new topic, which is going to be very important for the next half of the course when we start to develop the statistical mechanics. And this topic is entropy. So I will start just by defining what we mean by entropy, and then I'll go on to explain why it's so important. Okay, so let me define it. We define the change in entropy of a system. Entropy is given the symbol S, capital S, as the integral from over time, so from time t1 to time t2, say, of the 1 over the temperature of the system times the rate at which heat is going into the system integrated over time. This is 1 divided by the temperature. This is the rate at which heat goes in. And if you integrate that over time, this is the definition of the change in entropy. So you can write this in an approximate form like this. It's the integral from the original to the final state of the system of dq over t. Here, 1 denotes the initial state. 2 denotes the final state. So that's how it's defined. Let me just give you a very simple example to illustrate this. Calculate the change in entropy for an isothermal expansion. <coughs> of the ideal gas. Okay. Okay. So to do this, we say, well, it's isothermal. This means that the change in temperature is zero, which means that the change in internal energy is zero. And then the first law of thermodynamics, therefore, tells you that the change in heat must be equal to the change in work. And we already know that if a small amount of work is equal to pressure times change in volume. So therefore, the change in entropy is equal to the integral from the initial state to the final state, dq over t, that's the definition. So then I can use this result for dq to say that this is the integral from v1 to v2 of p over t dv. Now I can use the fact that it's an ideal gas, so in other words, pressure times volume is equal to number of particles times Boltzmann constant times temperature. So P over T is equal to NK over V. This is the integral from V1 to V2. N Boltzmann constant over V dV. So these are constants. So I've got an integral of 1 over volume d volume, and this gives me a log. So the final result is that the change in entropy is equal to number of particles times Boltzmann constant times the log of the volume, ratio of volumes. Okay, so this is an example of how you can calculate it based upon the definition. For an isothermal expansion of an ideal gas, you get this result. So now I've defined it, 
it's a bit of a strange definition. I want to explain why it's so important. And to explain why it's important, I'm going to give you two results about it. The first one is that entropy is what's known as a state property. What this means is that the change in entropy between any two states of a system is independent of the path you take between those two states. So the change in entropy between any two states one two is independent of the path taken. That's what it means to be a state property. So I can illustrate this in a pressure volume diagram as follows. Suppose I start in some state up here, let's call this one state one, and I end up in some state down here, let's call this one state two. There are many different ways of going between these two states, right? I could do a kind of smooth expansion like this, so I could go down and then across. Or, you know, I could do something, you know, really crazy if I wanted to. There are lots of different ways of going between these two states. Okay, lots of different ways to change the system. What it means that entropy is a state property is when you calculate the change in entropy of all of these different paths, you find that they have the same change in entropy. So when you calculate the change in entropy along any of these paths, it's always the same. This fact is not clear from its definition, but is found empirically when you do experiments, you find that this is true even though it is not immediately clear from the definition of entropy. So that's a state property. It means that if I go between two states of a system, the path I take doesn't matter. Though many other things are also state properties. Change in entropy is a state property. The temperature is a state property. The temperature here and here doesn't depend upon the path you take. The volume, pressure, internal energy, U, all of these things are state properties. Which means I only need to know the point to define these properties. I don't care about the path taken to reach that point. The second point about entropy, which makes it a very important property, is that it can be used to express a physical law known as the second law of thermodynamics. So I will explain what this is. It says that for a closed system, the total entropy always increases with time. Okay, so 
can write this down as an equation quite simply. If I take the change in entropy with respect to time, then this is always greater than or equal to zero. Right, so this law is very important, and probably in the next lecture, we're going to talk about some of its effects. So for now, I just want to note some things about this. First of all, closed is a technical term here. A closed system means that you don't allow any external influences to affect the system. So in particular, no energy or momentum or whatever is transferred to the system from outside. Okay. So it's closed in the sense that nothing outside influences the system. The system's dynamics are only determined by the internal dynamics of the system. Okay. That's what it means to be closed. I'll give you some more terminology now. You see that the second law says that the change in entropy is greater than or equal to zero. Now, if the change in entropy is equal to zero along some process when you change the system, then the process is called reversible. And if the opposite is true, ds by dt is strictly greater than zero, then the process is called irreversible. So that serves as a definition of these two terms, reversible process and irreversible process. Okay. Um, so I want to give you an idea of why these terms make sense. Reversible means you can do the opposite of something, right? So suppose I started with my system in some state one here, and I ended up in some state two here, and I went along this way in a reversible process. So in other words, ds by dt is equal to zero as I go along this way. And suppose I can also get the same change of state, why not, from a different kind of system, a different kind of process, sorry, and as I go along this process, there is a strictly positive change in entropy. Now suppose I try to go back. Okay, so I've gone from state one to state two. What happens if I try to go back to state one? Well, if I'd gone through an irreversible process from state one to state two, then the change in entropy is positive. In order to go back, I would have to have a negative change in entropy. Right? If the change in entropy is positive this way, then going back it will be negative. But the second law says it's not possible. It's not possible to get a negative change in entropy. So for this process, I can go this way, but I cannot go the other way. It's not allowed. Okay? The second law of thermodynamics says you can't go back. But if the change in entropy is zero, then I can go both ways. I can go this way and I can go back. Because in both cases, change in entropy is zero, and that satisfies the second law of thermodynamics. So processes are called irreversible, that's this blue one here, because you can't undo them. You can go this way, but you can't go back. Reversible process, you can do both ways. Okay. Okay. And one final note. So if I've got this closed system, <coughs> 
this closed system can undergo some changes. Each time it undergoes a change, the entropy must increase. That's what the second law says. When the state of the system changes in time, the entropy must increase. So if you wait long enough, you may reach a state which has maximum entropy. Once you reach the state of maximum entropy, you can't increase anymore, yeah. by definition. So the state of maximum entropy is necessarily an equilibrium. Once you reach this state, you can't change, because the second law says you can only increase entropy. Once you reach the maximum entropy, you must stay there. Yeah. So the state of maximum entropy is an equilibrium. Okay. It's a stable state. Once you reach the state of ma maximum entropy, you can't leave that state unless there is an external influence on your system. OK, so I've defined what entropy is, and I've defined why it's important. Firstly, it's a state property. The path doesn't matter. And secondly, the second law of thermodynamics says that the entropy must always increase. So now I just want to look at a series of examples to try and develop this concept of entropy some more. So for the rest of this class, I'm going to look at various examples of these processes. Okay, before I do that, let me say that this fact that certain processes are irreversible because of the entropy requirement is very important for the world as we see it, right? A classical example is if I take a glass filled with water and I drop it and the glass smashes, that results in an increase in entropy. So before there was a glass here in one piece, as I drop it and it smashes, the entropy increases. That means it's impossible to go back. It's impossible for the little bits of glass to reassemble and to form a perfect glass in my hand. So the fact that entropy is always increasing is why you know you see glasses smash but you never see them come back together again. It is driven by the second law of thermodynamics. Right, okay. Right, so now let me develop some examples. So first of all, I want to consider just a very simple example where I have two systems which are joined together. The first system is at temperature T1, second system is at temperature T2, and they are joined together, and then they are closed from the environment, so they are thermally isolated from everything else. Now, as a result of the temperature differences between these two systems, it's possible that heat can flow from one to the other, right? For example, if this one is hot and this one is cold, you would expect heat to flow from the cold one to the hot one. Right, so let's work out what does the change in entropy look like in this case. Well, the change, let me do a small change, a small bit of heat transfer. The change in entropy of the first system is equal to the amount of heat going in, well that's delta Q, divided by the temperature of the first system. That's the definition. The change in entropy of the second system is equal to the energy going in, well as I've drawn it, it's minus delta Q, because as I've drawn it, Q is going out rather than in divided by the temperature of the second system, that's T2. So we get a total change in entropy which is the sum of these two. Delta S is equal to delta Q 1 over T1 minus 1 over T2. So if I imagine this process changing over time, then the rate of change of entropy with respect to time is equal to the rate of transfer of heat 
times this difference of the inverse temperatures of the two systems. And we know from the second law of thermodynamics that the change in entropy must always be positive, so we must have that dq by dt times 1 over t1 minus 1 over t2 must be greater than zero, okay. because the change in entropy must be greater than zero. Now let's look what this means. Well, first of all, if temperature 2 is bigger than temperature 1, so if T2 is hot and T1 is cold, in this case, 1 over T1 is bigger than 1 over T2. So in this case, this is positive. So in this case, this is also positive. So that means if T2 is bigger than T1, then heat will flow from system 2 to system 1. So if this one is hot and this one is cold, then heat flows from the hot to the cold. In the other case, if this one is hot and this one is cold, so T1 is bigger than T2, then this thing is negative. Right? If T1 is bigger than T2, then this is negative. That means dQ by dt must also be negative. That means that heat must flow from T1 to T2. So in both cases, if this is hot and this is cold, then heat flows this way. If this is hot and this is cold, then heat flows that way. So the law of the second law of thermodynamics implies that the heat will flow from the hot system to the cold system, which, as we all know, that's what it does. So let me write that now. So if T1 is greater than T2, okay, no, let me do the other way around first. If T1 is less than T2, then 1 over T1 minus 1 over T2 is greater than 0, which implies that dQ by dt is greater than 0, which means that heat flows from 1 to 2. Sorry, heat flows from the other way around, right, as I've drawn it. Heat flows from 2 to 1. And in the opposite case, the reverse is true. So if T1 is greater than T2, then this thing is less than zero, which tells me that the rate of heat flow is less than zero, as I've drawn it there. That means that heat is flowing from one to two. So this tells you one very important consequence of the second law of thermodynamics. Heat always flows from hot to cold. So the second law implies that heat always flows from the hot system to the cold system. In a closed system, right? It's important to specify in a closed system. Air condition is an example. An air conditioner moves heat from cold to hot. Okay? So that does the reverse. But with an air conditioner, energy is coming from outside. Right? You have to put in electrical energy to shift the heat. In a closed system, the heat will always go from the hot body to the cold body. Okay? Another thing we can say is if I draw a graph of the total entropy as a function of the temperature T1, then if, and let's suppose that T2 is somewhere here, if T1 is 
greater than T2, then decreasing T1 gives an increase in entropy. If T1 is less than T2, then decreasing T1 gives you a drop in entropy. Okay? So at the equilibrium point, when the two temperatures are equal, the entropy is maximized. And this is what I stated. Well, it's an example of the result I stated. The state of maximum entropy is an equilibrium state. In this case, maximum entropy occurs at thermal equilibrium when the temperatures are equal. So this is an important result. You get maximum entropy when the temperatures of the two systems are equal. So this is the second example. And I do this example just to check that entropy is a state property, as I told you it was. This example is in order to check the fact that entropy is a state property. Okay. Now, We've already calculated change of entropy in one case in a PV diagram. And this is the case for isothermal expansion of an ideal gas. We said if you start here and you go down here, so this is isothermal. So I started at temperature T. I end at temperature T. Then if the change in volume is V1, V2, I, we calculated that the change in entropy was equal to number of particles times the Boltzmann constant times the log of the ratio of volumes. We got this result. Now, I claimed that entropy is a state property. That means however we move from the, this point to this point, we should get the same number. So I just want to check that's the case for another simple example. And I'm going to take the case where instead of doing an isothermal expansion, I first do a process at constant volume like this. And then I do a, cons a process at constant pressure. So let's call these pressures as well P1, P2. Okay, so instead of calculating entropy along the isothermal expansion, I'm going to calculate it along this direction, and provided that entropy is a state property, as I said, we should get the same answer, okay? which is that. So first of all, we do process at constant volume, then process at constant pressure. Okay. Uh, okay. Let me call this, because I'm using this notation for the problems, let me call this A and B. Okay, so first of all, what's going on along A? Well, A is a process at constant volume, which implies that the change in heat is equal to the number of particles times heat capacity at constant volume times the change in temperature. It's the definition of heat capacity, right? So therefore, the change in entropy, delta S, A, let's call it, is equal to the integral dQ over T. And I substitute this for dQ. So this is equal to NCV integral dT over T. And this integral goes from the initial temperature, which I just called T, to the final temperature here. Let's call this temperature T prime. Okay. So between T and T prime. And again, this is a log. So this turns out to be N times the heat capacity times the log of T over T prime. That's the entropy change along process one, process A, sorry. And we can do 
the same analysis, a long process. B. Okay. So the change in entropy, a long process. B. Okay. No. B is at constant pressure. So in this case, we have to use the heat capacity at constant pressure. So change in heat into the system. So heat into the system is equal to the number of particles times the heat capacity times the change in temperature. So therefore, the change in entropy is equal to the integral dq over t, which is, now substitute this, n times the heat capacity times the integral dt over t. And now we're going from the reverse, so we're going from temperature t prime to t. And this gives you ncp times the log of t over t prime. Sorry, in which case this one is wrong, sorry. Here, the t prime is up here, right? T prime over t. This one's t over t prime. Okay, so the total change in entropy is the sum of these two. So I'll just write it first of all, ncv log t prime over t plus ncp log t over t prime. Now we can simplify this a bit. Log of a is equal to minus log of 1 over a. Right? So I can write this as n times Cp minus Cv times the log T over T prime. And I know for an ideal gas that the difference between the two heat capacities is just equal to the Boltzmann constant. So because this is an ideal gas, I can write this as N times the Boltzmann constant times the log T over T prime. And what I want to show is that it's the same as this, right? I want to show that the change in entropy does not depend upon the path. So this should be equal to this. Right? These two things should be equal. You can see that the form is nearly equal. NKB is the same. I've just got to show that V2 over V1 is equal to T over T prime. Now I can do that by just using the ideal gas equation of state. We have that... If I look on this graph at this point here, I'm at pressure P2 volume V1, and here I'm at pressure P2 volume V2. Right, so the ideal gas equations of state tell me that P2 times the volume, which is V1, is equal to N times the Boltzmann constant times the temperature there, which is T prime. And at the final point, the pressure is P2, the volume is V2, and this is equal to N times Kb times the temperature T. And you see that if I divide these two equations together, I get the result. Okay? If I take this divided by that, then I get that V1 over V2 is equal to T prime over T. And therefore, Delta S, which is N K B log T over T prime, is equal to N K B log V1 over V2 over V1, okay. which is the same as for the isothermal. Okay, so that's the end of this example. What we've done is we've taken two states of the system, 
and considered two different ways of going between them. One is an isothermal expansion and one as a constant volume plus a constant pressure process. We've calculated the entropy and we've shown that the change in entropy is the same in both cases. So as I said, entropy is a state property. It doesn't depend upon the path. 